is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Veronica Mars, Season 1, Episode 22, Leave It to Beaver. In this episode, we find out who killed Lily. I want to say I knew it, but I didn't really know it. I like kind of, I had my suspicions, but it was really a tense episode. And if you want to see me freaking out in real time about it, please go to the Facebook page because the thumbnail alone. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha, and this episode is brought to you by Agnes and Nancy. Um, They commissioned the voyeurs so that everybody got to laugh at me completely freaking out. And I can't even, you guys, so much goes on in this episode. You, I was about to say you should have seen my face, but you can see my face. It is on video. Um, It is... It's. It was at one point I have my like face covered, my whole head covered in a blanket because I just got so like freaked out on behalf of everybody. And I really enjoyed that even though it, it, a lot of it, it has like a happy ending. A lot of things get wrapped up. It's a tricky thing um, to have a show and, and, Anybody who has watched, like, you know, the example I always use is Desperate Housewives. Desperate Housewives had a really tricky, interesting, like, trashy, in some ways, mystery for their first season. And that show went on for six seasons, I think. It might be longer. But you can see the first season's the best by far. And they did not leave enough open at the end but by like when they wrapped up the main mystery to make you interested in the next season, what they tried to do, I think was like start up a new mystery, but it's a really hard, like narratively um, thing to sustain an audience's interest. If everything centered around this certain mystery and you have solved it, well then what do you want to keep watching for? without their introducing a whole new separate mystery that is almost never as compelling as the first one. And oftentimes what they have to do is bring in a whole new couple of characters and have this new mystery involve people that you haven't met, that you don't really care about yet. And it works sometimes, but mostly it doesn't. It's a really tough thing to pull off. This show has done something really smart, and we'll see how it pans out. Obviously, I haven't seen any of season two yet, so I don't know. But I think it's really smart to end it with Veronica's garbage piece of shit mother stealing their 50 grand. Let's talk about that. I don't know how she plans to cash that shit, because I imagine that it is in Keith's name. But, you know, nevertheless, it's interesting, and I want to know what happens. And also, we leave with fucking Weevil menacing, uh, oh my god, I was just about to call him Rory, Logan, on the bridge, where Logan, I believe, is like, thinking, I'm not sure if he's thinking about jumping or if he's just standing there like, Mom, I can't believe that you fucking left me. Um, I it, it might be a combo. But I really care about both those things. I hate Veronica's mom, but I love Veronica and I love Keith. So what she's doing interests me deeply. I really like Logan, even though in a lot of ways he's a trash person. Nevertheless, I still like really want to know what happens to him. And also I'm super invested in Weevil not doing some stupid shit that he's going to regret. So what they've done is create a whole new like narrative thing that 
I don't know that any of that is going to be enough to sustain an entire next season, but it at least gets me wanting to watch the next episode instead of being like, wow, okay, well, that's wrapped up and that was a lot. Um, And I just applaud them on all fronts. And also, you know, I'm not sure exactly how this is going to go down with Aaron either, because spoiler alert, Aaron's the murderer. I didn't lead with that. Maybe I should have. Fucking Logan's dad was fucking his son's girlfriend. Like, this man could not get any trashier. He could not be any worse a dad. Like, I, I, you know, oh, Jesus Christ. Um, I really don't know how they're going to handle him being arrested. Are we going to have second season be his trial and like other revelations that come to light because of that? Is there, are we just going to like, you know, start and he's already like, it's an open and shut case. We've seen the evidence. Like we know that there's enough to put him away or is there going to be some weird thing that happens and he doesn't get put away and, and we have to deal with him like being on the street and like, you know, harassing Veronica because he she almost ruined his life. Or is it going to be a whole thing with Duncan's dad? Because Duncan's dad flips the fuck out at the end and is just like, I'm going to ruin you and everyone you love. And I'm like, well, Logan is still alive. What is Duncan's dad going to do with Logan? You know, I just there there's certainly possibility for all kinds of retribution that is not just or warranted in any way and could still make for really interesting television there there's just a lot that they can dig into um so i am just really fascinated by by the way this episode ended and managed to leave so many things open ended while still wrapping up the main part of the mystery um and i am disgusted by Aaron Eccles. Like, I can't emphasize enough how low-key predictable it is that he was doing this. And I don't mean this in, like, the writing is predictable. But they have really decided that they have figured out who he is and they're going to fucking zero in on what that means. And, yeah, he would definitely commit statutory rape with his son's girlfriend 100 percent. he beat the hell out of his kid i don't know if he beat his wife but i would not be surprised obviously he like meant like there was a lot of mental abuse going on from the way that she behaved and the fact that he had cheated on her with like a billion different women if she had been alive to see this i don't know if she'd even be surprised or not like it didn't seem like she was shocked by his infidelity initially, but if it were a girl of this age who was dating their son, I like to think that it, even she wouldn't have seen that coming. But I don't know. She is 17, Chris. Uh, he says, I'm not going to let a 17-year-old piece of ass ruin my life. Um. So, yeah, he's just like, and I would like to go on record as saying that there are a lot of people who try and excuse this kind of thing or would try and say something like, first of all, they want to say like, well, she knows what she's doing. The Like the whole idea of statutory rape is not meant to, to insinuate, I think, that people under a certain age can't be sexual. It's supposed to be protecting them from adults who should fucking know better than to get involved with people who are like not emotionally or mentally in a place where they can have an adult relationship and know what that means. And I'm not saying that Lily is naive at all, but holy shit, she's a child. And it's a really tricky thing in TV because they always cast people as high schoolers who are, you know, like 22. So you get used to this thing on television where when you think of it in the real world and think about, oh, this 16 year old girl was sleeping with her teacher or, 
16 year old boy was sleeping with his teacher. You picture the high school students of television who are really in their 20s. And then you actually see the photo of the kid in question and realize that like, oh, my God, they're fu- they're a fucking child. Like, who is is looking at somebody of this age and like being like, oh, yeah, I could totally go for some of that. Like, there, as I get older, it is more and more inexplicable to me that somebody would be drawn to, especially when it's like a full on relationship. Like it seems with um, Aaron and Lily, it was purely sexual and there was like, they don't seem to even really like each other, you know, but that, then there are like relationships that people have, and I'm putting relationships in quotes, where it's like a 28 year old guy and a 17 year old girl, and the guy is genuinely dating her. And ha- having recently been 28, I have nothing in common with a 17 year old, and a 28 year old who feels like he does have a lot in common with a 17 year old needs to look at his life, look at his choices, reassess his priorities, and back the fuck away. And all of the people in her life should form a wall of human flesh around her to keep him away. So I just like, also the whole concept of fucking somebody who's the same age as your child, just to me like that. I just, mm -mm, nope, no, absolutely no, absolutely no. Like, so this whole thing, I just, I'm low key glad that I wasn't like in the um, fandom for this when it was like airing and that I haven't been around because I bet that there are people out there who are probably saying like, well, you know, what did Lily expect getting involved with somebody older? And it's just like, oh, my God, y'all are just so missing the point. Get out of here. Um, so, OK, let's begin with the. Um, oh, sorry. Nancy saying, I think emotional abuse. Sure. But he seemed pretty line in the sand about his dad hitting his mom and what went on with Trina. Not that hip- not that hypocrisy is out of the question. Yeah. Trina doesn't know any. So I'm wondering if it's just like he beat Logan because Logan's a guy. And, and that is sort of the, uh, you know, like he feels like a boy. You get to do that because I know that's a thing like my mother. Um, had two sisters and a brother and her father beat the hell out of her brother did not hit her or her sisters ever but her brother took a fucking beating and that might just be like you know his weird misogynistic personal code um all right but anyway sorry so we start off this episode um with keith well very first um, we get the recap of everything, which makes me go like, I don't know what's we have the face off with Logan and Weevil again in the like previously on. And I'm like, oh, OK, so that's going to come back up again. Um, but we have Keith bringing Cheyenne to the uh, head of his department, I think, or not his department, but like his old department um, uh, and trying to explain to him that she was with this guy that they convicted and he really is not interested. Um, he says, if this turns out to not be true, then this is a national joke. And I'm like, you know, there there really is. I I understand Keith being frustrated and, and wanting this guy to listen to him because we know that this is true. And we know that Abel Coons almost like slipped up and admitted to Veronica That he didn't do like that. He is not there's plenty of circumstantial evidence, but there is not enough. Oh, Nancy. Oh, it's a reporter. Oh, I didn't even put that together. I thought this was a fucking. Oh, man, I got this totally wrong. Then a reporter, I would think, would definitely pick this up and run with it Um, like immediately. If it was a cop, I would totally understand because there's not a lot to go on here. But okay, so this change that changes the whole thing. And this guy being like, oh, all due respect, I can't do this on the testimony of a hooker. And I'm just like, you need to shut the fuck up, dude. Um, but it turns out that he is going to take it and run with it um, in the end. He's very resistant initially. But once it gets out, it causes all sorts of problems that this came out. Um, Keith goes home and he gets the uh, the paternity test back in the mail. And I was so concerned 
that the show was just going to be like, well, who knows? And it doesn't, it didn't strike me as that kind of show that was just going to leave something like that in the air. But there, there have been things like that narratively before um, where there's just sort of a like, I don't want to say like a continuing mystery, but just a sort of question mark that gets left until like the last season of a show. And I did not want them to do that with this. If they did, I could have kind of understood it, but I feel like it would have gotten really old. Um, And she, he, when he gets home, like he's about to open it and he gets home and Veronica is in there with her mom making guacamole and they have, um, spoons in their mouths which is supposed to keep you from crying from onions which i need to try i wear contacts so usually onions don't bother me but i swear to god even sometimes with those it and it is miserable so i have never heard this trick before i've heard the like light a candle near your cutting board which kind of works not really i've there's all kinds of things hold a piece of bread in your mouth uh but this one i have never heard about and it's a really awkward terrible scene in a lot of ways to me because her dad comes home and there's like a smile on his face and I think in part it is sincere when he sees the two of them in the kitchen cooking together like (sighs) he's obviously happy that Veronica is happy right but like this is not what he wanted. And this is the kind of thing. And I can, I, I'm again, not criticizing the writing here because I know that this is something that a lot of other people experience or feel. And it is something that even as smart and aware as Veronica is, I could see her having a huge blind spot when it comes to her own family. But speaking for myself, I knew when my parents were not happy for my whole life, pretty much. I was incredibly aware because I could read body language pretty well. I'm, I'm a a somewhat insightful person, especially when it comes to human nature and, and, you know, the signals that people give off. So my parents could come from another room where I didn't hear a thing. And I could tell immediately from looking at them if they had had a fight, if they were, if things were still like tense between them, it oftentimes I could even sense what the fight had been about based on like comments that they each made, like as the day went on and Veronica just harping on her mother coming home after everything her mother did and acting as if her dad should just accept this and be okay with this is so tone deaf and selfish to me. I know that people want their family to remain together. I understand that in concept. I did not. I wanted my parents to divorce because being around them was fucking miserable. But I know that I'm kind of in the minority on that and that's okay. But Veronica loves her dad so much and I just can't take the fact that she sees him walk in and can tell that it's just not what he wants. Like there's no way she doesn't see that they're not happy together. Not only... Did your mom cheat on your dad often enough that your own paternity is in question? But you knew before he did. I assumed once Veronica found out that maybe he wasn't her father. I assumed that Keith also knew. And then we find out he had no idea that he might not be her father and like went and did this paternity test on his own. That on in on its own is enough for plenty of people to be like, oh, you know what? This is not going to work. I can't trust you. But then her mother bails and and flees and does this for months, like almost an entire year. And the, I, the idea to me that Veronica expects him to just welcome her home and go back to normal after pulling a stunt like that And not even having the decency to tell him about the potential question of her paternity after leaving or after coming back, like having a conversation with him about it. 
He had, like I said, this paternity test he did in secret on his own. She did not talk to him about it. We don't see that. And I believe it never happened. So it's, I I am really glad that things like wind up falling apart and that she gets kicked out. But I also am disappointed that the only reason Veronica decides that she's going to cut her mother out of her life is because she finds out that she didn't finish rehab and is still drinking. There are so many other things that you should already have been worried about. The drinking is, uh, frankly, for me, on the bottom of the list of offenses that her mother has committed and is the one that has the most potential to be solved. Like, out of everything, that's the one that's the most quantifiable. And I would have been really surprised if the rehab took on the first try because quitting drinking is no goddamn joke. Alcoholism is a monster with like 40 heads. Like, you know, the kind of Hydra that you cut one off and two more come back. Like it is a battle you fight your entire life. And one bout at rehab coming back clean and sober after that is unheard of practically like you can be sober and most of the time people will fall off the wagon again at some point so i wasn't shocked that her mom was still drinking at all my mother's an alcoholic my dad used to be an alcoholic like i know this whole thing so but i i just the fact that veronica is and she's like i gambled on you and i lost and i'm like i don't know why you gambled on her because there was nothing about her that indicated she was interested in making this work the way that you wanted to make it work she never said that she wanted to come home and go back to normal she never said that she was sorry for putting you and her father through what she did in a way that felt sincere to me or indicated that she understood what she'd done all it was was her lamenting how hard things had been for her. So I don't want to say that I flat out blame Veronica because she's doing what she can and she's a fucking child. But I just, the, the alcoholism being the like thing that broke her back. I'm just like, how are you not seeing the other things, the other factors? Um, so I just wanted to talk about that in general. And I also want to say that I really, think it's a stroke of genius. I don't know who cast her mom, but I love the fact that her, there is nothing about her mother's appearance or demeanor that says deadbeat villain. Nothing. She's really like kind of just bland looking. She has kind of like sad eyes in, in that make you feel sympathetic despite yourself She's just got this whole sort of of look to her that you would expect a woman that looks like this to be cast as a likable person on a show, somebody that and I really love the fact that the show cast her and then made her this terrible mom because it's just so much more true to life. It's really easy to fall back on the like, well, let's cast somebody who looks like a scumbag for something like this. But that just gives this like impression that in life you can look at people and tell who they are. And that may be true at times, but, you know, there are so many abusive garbage parents out there who seem perfectly likable at first. And it does make you understand why Veronica is like trying to see the best in her in some ways as well. So I I do like that as much as like, I know everything that she's put the two of them through and I don't like it her because of that. I still do like see her and kind of go, but she seems so nice. I still have that like gut reaction. And, you know, y'all, when she fucking decides that she's going to take that check. The top of my head almost came clear off. I my rage I am not going to get over that. That is some fuckery. That whoever thought to like include that in the script is diabolical because like I thought we were going to be done with her. I thought that this was going to be some shit that Veronica was going to have to like work through mentally, but that we weren't going to have to deal with this woman anymore. 
And now she has just, when somebody lets you down the way that she let Veronica down, they keep doing it. They keep doing it. It's not like you can't change. But usually when somebody has been low key about lying to you and letting you down and you figure it out, they sort of decide, well, the cat's out of the bag that I'm trash. So I may as well fucking go for being trash. And that's what I feel like kind of happened is that she is like, she knows that Veronica's aware that she wasted all this money and time and energy. And she's like, well, you know what? She's never going to forgive me. So I may as well do something unforgivable and look out for myself. And I can't wait to find out what happens. I can't wait. Um, <laughs> Rachel says, I had to turn the volume down in my computer because the swearing was so loud. You guys, I just lost my fucking mind. Like everything else in the episode, I was already so tense and worked up and like, but that more than anything sent me right over the edge of just being like, I can't believe this. Um, so I know that this episode is not supposed to be about her mom, but I talked about her mom for like a straight up 15 minutes here. But I just, you know, this is something that I feel pretty strongly about, um, especially as somebody who is currently in therapy and is like starting to see pa like see patterns now that I didn't as a kid. And I, like I said, I was still a pretty perceptive kid. So there's a lot here that I'm like, how Veronica, how are you not seeing, you know, um, and I'm really glad that in the end, Veronica decides that she's going to, uh, to get Alicia to come to Keith's bedside because she knows that that's going to make him happy. I just wonder what Keith thinks because he knows that, Veronica is aware he dumped Alicia. So he must know that if Alicia's here, that means that something is going on with Veronica's mother, which makes me go like, what is Keith thinking when he wakes up and sees this woman here? Like, mm, you know, um, and in some ways, I wish that Veronica had not found out that her mother was cheating um, by drinking because I, I would have liked this moment of her calling Alicia to be her being like so moved by the fact that her father nearly died that she chose to to admit to herself that Alicia makes her father happy and her mother doesn't. And she's going to do the thing that makes him happy instead of herself because she almost lost him and she's reevaluating what's important. I really would have liked that better than for her to have done this once she realizes that her mother ain't shit. Um, but, you know, nobody's perfect. What can you do? So, okay. I I talked about that for way too long. Forgive me. Um, let's go on to uh, more of this actual murder mystery story. Keith decides um, that he is going to sue the Canes to get them to pay up. Which, listen. I... I 100% support and the fact that they like made it get to this point I was just like you got nobody but your own self to blame Celeste ah Celeste I she feels like the kind of character that I might eventually actually start to like if they do the right thing with her I feel like she's the sort of character that you dislike when you're on this side of things but when it turns around and she's on your side, you realize that she's kind of like indispensable, but it's just being up against her. That's terrible. Do you know what I mean? Like she sort of reminds me of a less funny version of the um, campaign consultant in Parks and Rec. If any of you have watched that show where she comes in to work for, uh, for, oh my God, I can't, Danny Newport or Donnie Newport. And She's lethal and going up against her is terrible because she's really good at her job and you kind of want to hate her. But then it she you have to respect the fact that she's so good at her job. So I'm hoping that there's going to be some other stuff with Celeste because we've just at this point, all we know about her is that she did not seem to like or respect Lily. 
that she did not want to tell Duncan the truth about what happened. Um, and I understand why not. And that she is like going to try and swindle Keith based on the like, the, what did she say? Um, Veronica and I made an arrangement. Newsflash lady, you made an arrangement with like, a 17 year old girl, a, a verbal arrangement that nobody witnessed. You have to know that means absolutely nothing. Get the hell out of here. You know, um, Nancy says interesting reversal and re reversal from when V said the hero is the one who stays. And Keith said that maybe wasn't the most healthy perspective. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. Back, back around again. Um, so, yeah, this, this, you know, eventually comes down to them ask, like, making a deal with Keith that they'll pay him the 50 grand if Veronica, if he will sign away Veronica's rights to anything on the Kane estate, which, of course, his lawyer doesn't understand the paternity thing. He doesn't know anything about that. So he doesn't get why this is, like, the deal breaker. But Keith is like, I am going to ask Veronica to sign this. I am not making this decision for her. And this leads to like the most touching scene in the episode where he he puts it in front of her and doesn't tell her anything. And she signs it without even fucking like it. There's no hesitation at all. And then he says, do you know what you just signed away? And she says with complete sincerity, I don't want anything from them. And he says, nothing. You didn't sign away anything. I am your actual father. And the two of them just break down in tears and hug each other. And it is such a well-acted, sweet scene. And there is a part of me, I won't lie, that was kind of like, Keith, you kind of seemed to be testing Veronica to see what she would do, which isn't entirely fair when you know whether or not she was giving something up or not. But also, I really understand that impulse. Um and I think that he knew how she was going to respond. Um, but it's just such a good moment. The two of them are just, the relationship is really sweet and fascinating. And, and it's a constant back and forth of like trying to balance being a parent and being also like a, an ally to your kid. I don't even want to say a friend because I feel like that's too casual a word for who Keith is definitely paternal I never feel like he's trying to be cool dad you know like he's just it, it, there it, there is like a there's still a friendship there but whenever I think of like a parent who's also their kid's friend honestly that comes with like the assumption that their parent is a tiny bit of a loser and that's probably not fair but it sort of like puts in mind to me that the kid needed to be a parent more than the parent was, because that's just the experience that I have had and that a lot of my friends have had, um, that if they, if they're, especially if their parent was the one who would use that kind of language, like, well, I, I am friends with my kid, that they also were willing to like shirk certain parental responsibilities and I don't think Keith is like that. So that's part of why I'm reluctant to use that phrase that he's her friend. But I think it's true. Um, so I'm probably assigning some baggage to that. That's not really fair. Um, so, yeah, I just that scene is so good together. And I was so happy about it. And, you know, I like the fact that as much as it might have been richer drama to have her be a cane, technically, um, and and have them all struggling to accept that having her be his daughter and erase the creepy guilt surrounding sleeping with Duncan and everything with that, that I think is um, just a nice like it's I think it's a kind move on the part of the writers. And it also like opens up the possibility for things to get serious with her and Duncan again. I'm not sure they could ever do that. I don't know if you ever get past some of the things that they've gone through over this past year. 
But there's that's the interesting thing about like trauma is that can it can separate people or it can make them like drawn to each other because they are the only people who really understand. Um, so, all right, let's talk about Duncan now that I brought him up and the fact that his parents think he killed Lily. This is some shit, guys. This is some shit. I just didn't buy that he killed her. Even when his parents told him, I was just like, this doesn't make any fucking sense. Like they didn't see it happen. They just came out there and he was covered in blood and that's the memory they've got. And I'm just like, you didn't see it. And he doesn't say he did it. And he didn't say he did it in the moment. And were his fingerprints on the weapon? Like you don't like, no, you know, there's just no reason to buy this, but it bums me out so much that they thought he had this whole time and they didn't say anything to him. Like that, that is just, I don't know how I would handle that. I, but I like to think that I would not have handled it this way. This feels so much crueler. Um, because I guess, you know what it comes down to for me is their assumption is that he had an episode and hurt Lily in the midst of this. And then when he came out of it, he didn't remember having done it. Now, I don't know what evidence they have that he doesn't remember episodes in his past. Like we have Logan talking about how he walked in on Duncan, like basically choking his dad and then getting up and being himself immediately. I don't remember if Logan said that Duncan didn't even seem to realize what he had just been doing or didn't remember that it had happened or anything like that. So if you guys want to refresh me on that, let me know. Um, but the thing that kind of kills me about this whole I, like method of dealing with it is that his parents don't know that Duncan won't eventually remember. And what kind of horrible trauma will that inflict? Him suddenly realizing and having this like horrible, like guilt flooded memory of killing his sister and then realizing that his parents covered things up for him, that they paid a man to go and live in prison and be on death row to cover up for him, like the the amount of guilt and baggage surrounding if he did ever remember is astonishing. And they just don't seem to have taken the possibility of that into account at all. I can't like, how do they not think that might happen, that that's a possibility? And especially like once you actually see the like the way that it did happen and they come outside and they're like what did you do duncan and he doesn't answer them or say anything i mean i understand that it's sort of occam's razor at that point he's there holding her he has had mental issues in the past assuming that he did it is the simplest solution but the fact that he isn't saying anything to them and answering any of their questions or responding in any way feels like it should have raised some red flags for them. So yeah, when he like, like demands to know the truth because they just keep on fucking lying to him, his mother still doesn't want to tell him the truth. And I just like Celeste, look, I get it. It's a horrible thing to put on your kid to, to like tell them some shit that they did. So you say that they don't even remember. But again, he's, tormented right now by all of the potential versus you just telling him the truth. There comes a point where your imagination can do such worse shit to you than reality. Now, I think telling him that he did it is probably worst case scenario for what he could have imagined. But nevertheless, at least put him in a place where it feels like he's got facts that he can cling to and and think through and deal with versus clouds of vague uncertainty. And so, yeah, I, I understand, really, really do her reluctance to tell him. 
But I think his dad really did the right thing. Like, it's about time. You can't have all of these loose ends suddenly cropping up and keep on with the story that you've been doing. You know, like, and and the fact that Duncan, like, when Keith goes over there, because we have Keith's flashback when he's explaining to Veronica why he felt something was fishy with the canes. He goes there and uh, they have that laundry running, which he finds really weird. And Duncan is sitting out by the pool, just not moving, if I'm not mistaken, right? Like, he's not in the room with the two of them when Keith's questioning them, right? Um, So apparently, like, Duncan went kind of catatonic for the rest of the day, maybe longer, after finding his sister. Um, I just, oh, man, I really fucking feel for Duncan. He's just got, he's been dealing with a fucking lot. Like, when it comes down to it, as much as Veronica's in the middle of everything, because she's doing the investigating, Duncan has gone through nearly as much shit as she has. Um, And I just, I don't know how he's going to cope with all of this. And, And how do you forgive your parents for believing you were capable of that? And how do you know that you're not capable of that is probably also like a huge question for him. You know, like he if Logan's telling the truth, which I think he is, he was like strangling his dad at one point. So maybe the potential is there. Um, But I just feel like, yeah, this whole so that whole scene where they they tell him that he's the one who did it. Oh, God, I just feel so bad for him. And and he doesn't really have a defense because he doesn't remember. So he can't even just say anything like, no, I know I didn't. I found her. Like, it doesn't seem like he remembers finding her or else he would bring it up. Ah, oh, poor Duncan, poor kid. Um, So I'm sorry, I'm all over the place, but I'm just pretty much going character by character since there's such a big wrap up here. And of course, then we have like, because of him thinking that he did it, um and his parents telling him that he did it then we have the whole thing that comes up with logan's alibi not holding any water and we see dick and beaver looking at the newspaper and like talking to each other about the fact that they swore that they wouldn't tell anybody which you know the episode is leave it to beaver which does make it sound like either beaver did it which i did not for a second think was true but who the fuck knows or Beaver's going to be instrumental in taking down the actual murderer. Um, it turns out that that is not exactly true. But Logan does look highly suspect. Logan had told police that he was in Tijuana when Lily died. Turns out he left Tijuana and came home for a little while. And his friends knew knew that. And knew that the time frame for when he was gone would have lined up, like, approximately with when she died. Now, I need to say this thing that's going to be probably controversial in the the theme of, like, the the snitches get stitches sort of question. But keep in mind that I'm saying this as somebody who just watched Dick and Beaver and fucking other kid like encourage date rape uh not even date rape just like you know rape rape these guys i am pretty positive think that logan killed lily i think that's what they believe happened and they are willing to cover for him eventually beaver comes forward and says something and i I I respect the fact that Beaver keeps on just being like the the only one that has any sort of spine and moral compass. But like Dick was 100% going to just not say anything and let his friend be a murderer and be continue to be his friend and be fine with that. That is some shit. Like There's a difference between a character who's like, 
you know, in the middle of some shit and there's an accident and you kill somebody in self-defense, but you can't go to the cops because you know that they're not going to believe the story because it's crazy. So you just help them hide the body and you both keep the secret and whatever. That's a very particular set of circumstances and a certain type of loyalty that I can respect a lot more. This is this is a whole other thing of an angry dude going home and so you think in a jealous rage killing his girlfriend and then like just going on and living his life and apparently dick was going to be okay with that like that's a truly bad person dick is fucking bad news guys like in every sense i think dick is has the potential to be a serious problem um, and I don't know if the show is really like looking at it the way that I am, but I hope they do because, wow, that whole like everything that that implies that it, it, he's one step away from being that kind of person himself. You know, like he was groping Veronica when she was fucking unconscious. You know, we already know that he's capable of some shit. So. And, and he was going to drug his girlfriend to get her to loosen up and actually have sex with him. Granted, he had taken the drug himself. Doesn't matter. He was still going to drug her. So, yeah, covering up for your friend who murdered his girlfriend in a jealous rage. This guy's bad. Bad, bad, bad. Um. So, yeah, Veronica finds out uh, that he, that Logan um, bought a shot glass um, for Lily and was going to give it to her. And the shot glass is not among the articles that were in her room, but it is found in the inventory of stuff that was in her car, which means as much as he says that he was not around Lily on the day that she died, that he was somewhere else, that he definitely did meet up with her at some point. Looks really bad for him. I wonder what happened to the letter because he says later when Veronica confronts him. You know what? I phrased that wrong. Veronica does not confront him. He confronts Veronica because he gets arrested. And he has his like phone call, which he does on his phone because they aren't about to let him have one. And he calls Veronica in front of Sheriff Garbage Face who then immediately tells him, ooh, wow, you called her? She's the one who turned you in, guy, just BT dubs. So he goes and finds her and tells her, look, I was sitting across from the um, the car wash when you guys were doing that. And I was just hit with this overwhelming feeling that things between me and Lily were over. I just knew and he was aware that she'd been seeing somebody else, but I get the impression that she'd done that before and always wound up coming back. And this was the first time that he really knew that that wasn't going to happen. So he leaves a note that he wrote to her and the shot glass in her car. And it's just like what kills me because, man, Lily is a little cold blooded. She had to have gotten in her car seen the note uh which logan the way that he says if you read it you'd know i'd never hurt her it's probably him pouring his guts out that he cares about her and wants her to be happy and then she goes to his house and fucks his dad or is about to (sighs) lily girl you are a mess um but yeah so veronica is so sure that it was probably logan That she's like calling her dad talking about this and fucking Weevil overhears her. And it's just by the 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 hairs on his chinny chin chin that Logan gets arrested before Weevil catches up with him and beats the hell out of him with a fucking baton. Um, And I just don't know when when Weevil catches up to him later. He's got a whole crew of people on a bridge in a public place. He is a very identifiable human being. His whole crew is there. I don't know what he thinks he's going to do that he can possibly get away with. I just have no idea. But anyway, 
like Lo I feel for Logan as well because there's so many things happening here. One, Veronica thought he was capable of murder and thought he had done it and turned him in and lied to his face about still being into him and wanting to date. That fucks your head right up. And poor Logan, like knowing that she believes that he could do that must suck. But then Logan's fucking dad fucked his girlfriend and was like letting his kid take the fall for it because make no mistake if they had been able to pin this on logan i do not for a second think that aaron was going to come forward and take the fall at all absolutely fucking not nope he is just too selfish and and, and what's the word i want uh narcissistic a person there's no way so veronica Sneaks into the Kane house dressed as a waiter because she's ridiculous. And she goes into Lily's room figuring that if uh, there is something that Lily, because she's, I think at that point, looking for the note that, um, that Logan said he left in the car. So she's thinking, okay, she hides things in different places. If she hid it. It would probably be in the air vent, the place where she hid other stuff, like photos of a naked man from Italy. Um, and she goes in there and starts to, like, unscrew the vent cover. And Duncan comes in and he's flipping out um, because, uh, you know, he thinks that he murdered his sister. And she has to talk him down and be like, I'm pretty sure that Logan did it. And I think that the evidence is in these vents. So he lets her finish searching and they find the tapes. They watch them and realize that she was sleeping with Aaron and Veronica is like, all right, I'm going to take these tapes to my dad um, because Aaron is there at the party with them. And she is, she should have fucking stayed put. It drove me crazy that they didn't get a bead on him and make sure that he was busy before she left. Because that was the whole thing is like, is uh, Duncan is assuring her that he'll keep this guy out of the way while she goes and does this. You get that fucking set aside and, and all like managed before you put yourself in the position of being alone, even in the parking lot of the house would have been dangerous, you know? So that drives me a little batty. And she calls her dad and he tries to get her to stay put and she doesn't want to listen to him. And she's like, no, but he's here. I can't stay here. The fact that he's there and there are also 200 other people is the best reason to stay there, Veronica. But okay, sure. And she gets in the car and she starts to head out and call Logan. If she was just going to call him and tell him, by the way, your dad did it. I just can't imagine what he would have even done. Like, if, if he had answered. Um, but she then gets a call from Duncan and he's just like, hey, I can't find him. And I'm like watching it going he's in the car with her oh my god and sure enough and uh what an idiot Aaron is such a drama queen which like totally fits with you know he's chosen to literally be a drama queen for a living um but I don't know what he was planning to do to like if he was gonna have her like drive to a certain spot take the tapes and then like murder her and leave her there or what but I don't know that he's necessarily thought it through and has a plan either. Um, but Veronica, very, in my opinion, smartly crashes the car. I feel like when you're in that position, there's really nothing else to be done. Crashes the car. He gets knocked out. So does she for a little bit. And she wakes up and takes the tapes back. If At first, I thought she was like um, checking to see if he was still alive and like, like trying to get to his wrist or something which i was just like you need it doesn't matter if he's still alive you just need to run but she's trying to get the tapes back because if she leaves him alone and he's not dead but he's still got the tapes he can still completely ruin the evidence so okay that's smart and she's getting the cell phone um but she can't quite reach it so she winds up just having a bail there's a house nearby she goes up to this house and is banging on the door i don't know what time of the day it's supposed to be but nobody comes to the door until she goes around to the back 
And by the time she's banging on the back door, she's like run around the house and and thrown the tapes in all these different places. She threw threw one up on the roof. She like dropped one another one in like a barrel, like just all these different spots to spread them out. And this dude who uh, answers the door, he like has a second to make eye contact with Veronica through the glass door before he goes down because Aaron, I guess, broke in somehow. I don't know how he managed this. This is the only part of the episode that I really have a problem with. One, how did Aaron break into the house without her hearing that he had done so? Because he'd have to have broken a window or something. She would have heard that. So he's in the house already, you know, like he's made some progress while she's just running around. I don't know how that could work. And I do not understand how it cuts from her seeing Aaron's face in the glass and him, his fist is coming at the camera and then it cuts and she wakes up and she's in a refrigerator. Are, am I supposed to believe that Aaron Eccles punched through the glass of the back door hard enough to knock her out cold? Because I don't. Spoilers. No, I do not think that could happen at all. At all. And if he did, his arm would be shredded. Like that glass would have fucked him up really bad. But the way that it's filmed, that's what's supposed to have happened, I think. Because the fist is coming at you. And then it cuts like she got knocked out from the punch. There's a fucking, like, you know, quarter inch thick piece of, of weatherproofed glass between her and him. There's no way. There's no way. So that pissed me off. Not going to lie. However, I'm going to let it go. But I need you all to know that I, I noticed it. Um, so she wakes up. She's in a refrigerator, which... I was more concerned that she was going to run out of air, to be honest. Um, but he is trying to get her to tell him where the tapes are so that he can grab them and that if he gets the tapes, he'll let her go, which is hilarious because, of course, he won't let her go. And she knows that. He says something like, I'll let you go. And she says, no, thanks. I feel safer in here, which is the right answer. But then he finds some fucking gasoline and begins to just dump it all over the refrigerator and the deck. And I was just like, oh, you fucking monster. Like, that's a pretty smart plan, actually. Well, lucky for her, Keith knows that she should have been home by now. The second he gets off the phone with her, pretty much, honestly, he doesn't really wait around. He, like, gets up and is immediately like, I don't like this. I don't like any of this. I'm I'm going to at least make sure that she's getting home okay. And he goes out and he finds her car and looks up the hill and realizes that there's a house there and that's probably where she went. So he comes up there and hears her like banging on the inside of the fridge and is distracted because fucking uh, Aaron is on the roof grabbing the tape, um, which he seems very happy to have found, even though there are like three tapes and he only had one. So he has to know that there's another one, like another two out there. But uh, apparently, I, th I, I think that he feels that the others are also up there and he just hasn't had a chance to finish looking for them. But um, yeah, poor Keith. <laughs> Aaron gets the drop on him in the most literal sense of the word. And they have this brutal fight. Really like, man, does Aaron fight dirty? He is a piece of shit. And uh, he is finally getting the upper hand. And Aaron, who I hate so deeply in all of my parts, lights the fire with the lighter, just as Keith is starting to get to the point that he's like winning and distracts him by being like, oh, by the way, your daughter's in that fridge that's on fire. And to his undying credit, Keith literally walks through the fire. This is a serious fire, folks. This is no like... There are TV fires that you see a lot that feel like 
there's little patches of fire, but you can get through. And I know that I'm supposed to believe the whole place is on fire, but I can see that you've set this up like as a stunt. This does not look like that. This looks very serious. And he busts through there and pulls Veronica out just in time to like get out himself. And he is on fire and she puts him out, but it like takes a minute and he is badly injured and winds up in the hospital. Um, but the most delightful turn of events ever, asshole Aaron is like, okay, I've got Keith's keys. I'm going to steal their car and get out of here. Well, surprise, motherfucker, backup is in the back seat and chews his arm up until he gets out of the car, which was so wonderful. I, I, backup, you need more to do in this show. It was so good. I loved it so deeply. And when he gets out and like tries to run back across the street, he gets hit by a truck, a van, a truck, something. I swear, you guys, I could not stop laughing. Like, I thought for like an instant that the the truck was being driven by Duncan, that Duncan realized that he couldn't um, find Aaron and that Veronica wasn't picking up and that there was probably something wrong and that he had like chased after her and was purposely hitting Aaron. But it turns out that it was a complete like circumstantial. It was just a coincidence. And the, the dude finding him, oh, my God, you're Aaron Eccles. And him being in the middle of like, help me when Veronica's like, don't touch him. That was super satisfying. I, I just want to see that man suffer. I hope that we get to see him suffering in season two. I hope, please. Um, And I also appreciate that uh, Duncan's father is arrested for obstruction of justice because, yeah, sure, it was his daughter that got murdered, but he also like was covering up for somebody he thought had done it and has like a perfectly innocent man in prison that he like paid off. So, yeah, that man deserves to be arrested also. I don't know what the fuck, guys. This is such a disaster. I've gone over time. So I'm going to have to wrap this up. But um, this was a really good episode, a really satisfying finale. I don't think anybody has booked the next episode yet. So I'm not sure if I, I, I'm not going to watch it on my own because I don't know if somebody's going to want that to be a live watch or not. Um, so I'm going to wait. But if it gets booked, um, oh, Oh, Anya says you did. Oh, you did. Oh, I didn't even see. Hold on. Let me look. Do, 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 do. Um, oh, for 4 p.m. on the 5th. Is that the one? Yes. Okay. So it's a regular one. So I can watch it right away. <laughs> oh, guys, I'm so excited. I can't wait to find out what happens. It is Jackie. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. That's great. Um, all right, guys. Well, thank you all so much for commissioning this show. This has been a lot of fun to cover. And I am just, I have so many questions about what's going to happen and how everybody's going to handle it. I don't know what to expect. So, um, I think we didn't want to torture you. Oh, Rachel, bless you guys. You guys are good. You're always thinking of me. Um, so yeah, guys, stay tuned for the next episode. I hope you've been enjoying the coverage. It's really good. Oh, I hate her mom so much. I'm so mad. And I will be seeing you Tuesday. And I'll just, for those of you who are listening, I don't know if this will be out in time for you to get there, but Tuesday, uh, February 5th at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time will be the next Crowdcast. So yay. All right, guys. Thank you all so, so much. See you soon. And toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.